the thorax and lung. Because we all depend on the respiratory system to survive, its assessment is a critical part of the physical examination. To help you perform those assessments as thoroughly as possible, this program will show you how to inspect, palpate, and percuss the thorax, and auscultate the lung sound. Throughout this examination, you'll see normal findings. But keep in mind that in your practice, you may see the same findings, normal variations, or abnormal findings. Before examining the thorax and lungs, consider their anatomy. For example, recall that the diaphragm separates the thoracic cage from the abdomen, and that the thoracic cage is defined by the sternum, 12 pairs of ribs, and 12 thoracic vertebrae. To localize your findings, remember the surface landmarks of the anterior thorax, the suprasternal notch, sternum, manubriosternal angle, or angle of Louis, which is continuous with the second rib, costal margins, and costal angle. Also, count down the ribs, beginning at the sternal angle. Palpate the second rib and slide down to the second intercostal space. Number each intercostal space by the rib above it. Count down the middle of the hemithorax to the tenth rib. On the posterior thorax, Use different surface landmarks. With the person's head flexed, feel for the most prominent bony spur, called the vertebra prominence, or the spinous process of C7. Count down the spinous processes. At the seventh or eighth rib, you'll reach the inferior border of the scapula. Finally, you'll reach T12 and the twelfth rib. To further pinpoint your findings, use reference lines. On the anterior thorax, note the mid-sternal line, mid-clavicular lines, and anterior axillary lines. On the posterior thorax, refer to the vertebral or mid-spinal line and the scapular line. And on the lateral thorax, imagine the mid-axillary line, anterior axillary line, and posterior axillary line. Consider the lungs and their structures. Anteriorly, the apices rise three to four centimeters above the clavicle. In the right lung, the horizontal fissure runs from the fifth rib in the mid-axillary line to the fourth rib at the right sternal border. The oblique fissure runs from the fifth rib in the mid-axillary line to the sixth rib in the mid-clavicular line. They divide the lung into the upper, middle, and lower lobes. In the left lung, the oblique fissure separates the upper lobe and lower lobe. Posteriorly, the apices reach C7. The oblique fissures divide both lungs into the upper lobes, which run from T1 to T3 or T4, and the lower lobes, which run down to T10 on expiration and T12 on inspiration. Note that the posterior chest is almost all lower lobes. On the right lateral thorax, the upper lobe extends from the axilla to the horizontal fissure. The middle lobe goes from that fissure to the sixth rib at the midclavicular line. And the lower lobe runs from the fifth rib to the eighth rib in the midaxillary line. On the left lateral thorax, the upper lobe extends from the axilla to the fifth rib at the mid-axillary line, and the lower lobe continues down to the eighth rib in the mid-axillary line. Within the thorax, the trachea extends from the cricoid cartilage to the sternal angle, where it bifurcates into the right and left main bronchi. The bronchi lead to the lungs, which are surrounded by the parietal and visceral pleura and contain millions of alveoli that cluster like grapes around each alveolar duct. Okay, I'm just going to take a look at your chest now. When inspecting the posterior thorax, first notice the shape and configuration of the chest wall. 
the anteroposterior diameter should be less than the transverse diameter. <coughs> the spinous processes should be aligned, and the thorax should be symmetrical with no deformity. Be aware that the normal size of the thoracic cavity varies with the person's culture. Whites tend to have the largest chest volumes, followed by black, Asian, and Native American. Next, observe the position the person takes to breathe. It should be relaxed and support his weight, with his arms resting at his sides or in his lap. Then assess his skin color and condition. There should be no cyanosis, pallor, abnormal pigmentation, or lesions. Okay, now I'm going to place my hands on your back and have you breathe normally for me. Begin palpating the posterior thorax by confirming symmetrical chest expansion. Place your hands on the posterolateral chest wall with your thumbs at T9 or T10. Slide your hands toward each other to pinch up a small fold of skin. Take a deep breath for me. Ask the person to take a deep breath. As he inhales, your thumbs should move apart symmetrically. Next, palpate for tactile fremitor using the ball of your hand while the person repeats a resonant phrase such as 99 or blue moon. Following a consistent pattern, palpate systematically, beginning over the lung apices. Move from one side to the other and down, avoiding the scapula. Vibrations should feel the same in corresponding areas on each side. However, they may feel stronger on the right side between the scapula because that side is closer to the tracheal bifurcation. Okay, Mary, place this on your back. I want you to tell me if you feel any pain or tenderness. Then gently palpate the chest wall. The skin should feel warm and dry, and you should detect no tenderness, masses, or lesions. To percuss the posterior thorax, follow this pattern systematically. Start at the apices and percuss across the tops of both shoulders. Then percuss in the interspaces, moving from side to side and down. In each area, note the intensity, pitch, and duration of the percussion notes. They should match side to side. Over the lungs, percussion should produce resonance. Over the viscera, percussion should cause dullness. Note any areas of abnormal dullness or hyperresonance over the lungs. Okay, Mr. Chang, I'm just going to need to put a few pen marks on your back. Is that okay? Now, use percussion to determine diaphragmatic excursion. When I tell you, I want you to exhale and hold it. To do this, ask the person to exhale and hold it. Okay, exhale and hold it. Then quickly percuss down the scapular line until the sound changes from resonance to dullness. Mark this spot with a pen. Next, ask the person to take a deep breath and hold it. Now take a deep breath and hold it. Good. Then percuss down from your first mark. At the point where the sound changes from resonance to dullness, make another mark. Okay, now we're going to do the same thing to the other side. So I want you to take a deep breath, exhale, and hold it. Repeat this procedure on the opposite side. Good. Okay, now inhale and hold it. The diaphragm may be one to two centimeters higher on the right side because of the liver. Then measure the difference between the two marks. Diaphragmatic excursion should be equal bilaterally and normally ranges from three to five centimeters or up to eight centimeters in well-conditioned athletes. Okay, Mr. Chang, I'm gonna listen to your lungs now. To prepare to auscultate the posterior thorax, ask the person to lean forward slightly let his arms rest in his lap, and breathe through his mouth a little deeper than usual. Clean the diaphragm of the stethoscope with an alcohol wipe. Then follow a consistent pattern for auscultation. Holding the diaphragm of the stethoscope firmly on the chest wall, listen from the apices at C7 to the bases, comparing breath sounds from side to side. 
Listen to at least one full respiration in each location. Also, auscultate laterally from the axilla down to the seventh or eighth rib. Because deep mouth breathing may tire an older person, allow brief rest periods or quiet breathing during auscultation. And if she feels faint, have her hold her breath for a few seconds. As you listen, ask yourself, what should I expect to be hearing over this spot? And what am I hearing? On the posterior thorax, you should hear bronchovesicular sounds over the major bronchi from T1 to T4. These sounds are moderate in pitch and amplitude, last equally long on inspiration and expiration, and sound like this. Over peripheral lung fields, from the clavicles to T9, you should hear vesicular sounds. They are soft, low-pitched rustling sounds that are longer on inspiration than expiration. They sound like this. You should not hear any adventitious sounds, such as crackles or wheezes. <laughs> Fine crackles are discontinuous, high-pitched, short crackling sounds on inspiration. Coarse crackles are loud, low-pitched bubbling sounds that start in early inspiration. High-pitched wheezes are musical squeaking sounds, mostly on expiration. are musical snoring sounds, mostly on expiration. In an older person, you may hear adventitious sounds called atelectatic crackles. <coughs> These short popping crackling sounds are like fine crackles, but do not last beyond a few breaths and occur only in the periphery. I'm going to have you say 99 every time my focus group touches your back. If you suspect a lung problem, auscultate for voice sounds as the person repeats certain words or sounds. First, ask him to say 99 as you listen with the diaphragm of the stethoscope. His voice should sound soft, muffled, and indistinct. If you can auscultate the word clearly, bronchophony is present. 99. Next, ask the person to make a long E sound. Every time you, feel my you should hear the E sound through your stethoscope. But if the E sounds like A with a bleeding quality, you have detected egophony. E. E. Good. Now I want you to whisper, one, two, three, every time my stethoscope touches your back. Then have the person whisper a phrase, like one, two, three. The words should sound very faint and muffled. If they sound louder and clear, you have elicited whispered pectoriloquy. One, two, three. One, two, three. To assess the anterior thorax, begin as you did on the posterior thorax, noting the shape and configuration of the chest wall. The ribs should slope down have symmetrical interspaces. The costal angle should be 90 degrees or less. 